characters. And the character that, uh, that sort of stood out to me as a, as a first one for us to tackle, and we're going to do this over the course of two weeks, is uh, a guy named Josiah. He's one of the kings uh, in Judah. And uh, how many of you have heard of Josiah? How many of you... So he's, so he's known, and, uh, and many of you obviously haven't. So we just want to dig into him and get to know him a little bit. I'm just going to read uh, the first couple of verses of the story in 2 Kings chapter 22, and then I'll give us a little bit of historical uh, context for Josiah. But all of the kings, when they're described in the Old Testament, they get like a little two-verse blurb that gives you a summary of their life. And so this is the summary of Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Interesting. And he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adidiah, uh, of of Bozkath, I should have worked on my pronunciations, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in all the way of David his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. That's pretty good. It's a pretty good intro. A lot of the other kings get introductions like so-and-so was a wicked king, and he did great evil in the eyes of the Lord, and the Lord wished very much to smite him with fire. And No, that's not, that part's not there. Uh, but uh, the, there, there were lots of evil kings in the story, right? But, but Josiah is one of the good ones. We're going to get a chance to look at him. Um, if we can look at that next slide with the map... Um, when I say, it's really often hard to take these Old Testament stories and sort of place them in time. So we're just going to do that and place them in geography. Um, Josiah was the king of a, a country called Judah, which was really about half of the geographical area of the promised land that the Israelites captured at the time when they came up out of Egypt. Um, so this is the southern part of the kingdom. It was dominated by people from the tribe of Judah, people who uh, were part of that particular tribe of the 12 tribes. The northern kingdom, uh, the 10 tribes of the northern kingdom, uh, were in about 735 uh, BC, were uh, taken into captivity by a nation called Assyria. And you'll see up in the north, there's a great nation there called Assyria. Over here is Babylonia. Down there is Egypt. And during this time frame, Assyria was sort of beginning to decline. A hundred years ago, it had taken over the northern kingdom of Israel. Babylonia was rising. Babylonia and Assyria were fighting, and eventually Babylonia would take over um, the, uh, the region, take over the area. But in the middle of it, there's this little King Judah that is uh, the kingdom of Judah. Uh, Judah was a kingdom that sort of stayed a little bit faithful to the Lord longer than Israel. Uh, but really, those kingdoms in the 350 years between the time of David and the time of Josiah, uh, they drifted from the worship of God and began to worship idols and began to uh, assimilate or, or began to take on the flavor and the nature of the cultures around them. They just began to sort of be absorbed and begin to sort of become corrupt and begin to sort of let those other practices, those other idols, those other cultural pieces uh, sort of inform them and become a major part of who they were. We think that uh, Judah remained a little bit faithful a little bit longer simply because it contained the city of Jerusalem in which the temple was. So there was just an anchor point in terms of the, the word of God being read and the scriptures happening there and a little bit of worship of God. But by the time we get to um, Isaiah or Josiah, it, it, it's basically gone and become a completely, almost completely pagan nation. There was still some semblance of the priesthood that was operating in that time. The temple was still there. It had fallen into disrepair. Uh, Josiah's uh, grandfather, Manasseh, was one of the most wicked kings in Judah. And he, um, I mean, he, he did everything. He worshipped the Baals. He worshipped uh, Asherah. Um, he sacrificed his own son uh, a, a, on an altar to one of these idols. Um, he was actually, Manasseh was actually one of the king, was, was the king, I believe, it's not seen clearly in the scriptures, but in Jewish extra-biblical writing, uh, Manasseh is the king that murdered the prophet Isaiah. He was the king that killed Isaiah. Um, and he had just this, this incredible, wicked, uh, long reign of over 50 years. But somewhere in the end of his reign, uh, Assyria, who was sort of occupying the land at the time, took Manasseh and uh, took him up to exile um, in, in the Assyrian kingdom. And in that space, he had an encounter with the Lord, and he repented, and he turned around, and the Lord sent him back uh, to take over Judah and to lead it again. And he began to do something of reform. Uh, for maybe a couple of years, we don't know how long that time frame was, but this wicked king turned. Um, and then at the end of his reign, when he died, 
um, his son Ammon took over, and Ammon went whole hog back into wickedness. Went whole hog and just abandoned any of the reforms that Manasseh had done. So he lived for only about two years before he was assassinated. Um, and that's the life, the brutal life of the kingdoms. Uh, this complete pagan surrounding culture that had really become central to the life of the Jewish nation. So Josiah was eight years old when he became king. What that meant was he grew up with probably a couple of years of his grandfather's reform. And then from about the age six to eight, uh, he lived under the rule of his father, and the rule of uh, this sort of uh, great wickedness of Ammon, restoring the idols and, and undoing every little good thing that uh, Josiah had, or Josiah's uh, grandfather had done. And so we don't know. Uh, Josiah is said to be, from the beginning, kind of a good king who kind of began to do good things. We don't know where that came from, other than that in the story, in that text, maybe we can just go back one slide for a second. In the text, we get his, the name of his mother, his mother's name was Jedediah, the daughter of Adadai, and, and it's very a bit unusual for the mother's names to be included in the text. So uh, just looking at the meaning of those names, that name Jedediah means beloved of the Lord, and Adadiah means the Lord drew near. And so it's like the author said, hey, there's something here that in Josiah's formation, uh, the Lord began to prepare him even when he was young. So he witnessed a little bit of his grandfather's reform, and he had this, uh, this uniquely committed to the Lord mother who, and we, we don't know anything about her, we don't know if that's really true, but I think maybe that's why um, we get there, the mother's names in the text. And so Josiah takes over the kingship at the age of eight. Remember, he's inherited an incredibly pagan environment. Uh, there are idols in the temple at this time. And uh, when he's in the 18th year of his reign, so now at 26 years old, uh, something interesting happens. Let's just read uh, the next slide, 2 Kings 22, 3 to 5. In the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent uh, Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, uh, son of Mes Mes I should have worked on these pronunciations, <laughs> Meshulam, uh, the secretary, to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to Hilkah the high priest, that he may count the money that has been brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the threshold have collected from the people. Just pause there. Uh, somehow in Isaiah's reign, he began to um, say, hey, we're going to need some money to uh, begin to care for the temple. The people at the threshold who let people in and out of the temple, you collect a little bit of tax. It's like when you go to Disneyland, you have to pay some fees to get in. I don't know what it worked, but to get into the temple, to cross the threshold, you had to pay something. And so Josiah began to build the fund uh, to repair the temple. I just, I just want to note these things. Like even in Josiah's time, ministry, there's all these little notes towards the financial investment that makes the good things happen. Um, so he, the money, the threshold collected from the people, and then give it to the workmen who are at the house of the Lord repairing the house. There's a little bit more to the story there, but for the sake of time, I'll, I'll skip over that just to say the workmen were known to be people of integrity. So Josiah is basically at this stage, uh, he has not seen the scriptures, he has not had any of that. He's been just bathed in paganism, but from his mother or his grandfather, he has some understanding of the Lord. And all he knows how to do with it at this point is just to begin to do good things, to begin to fix up the house of the Lord. Um, he, he might be compared to any one of us who sort of maybe grew up with kind of a nominal Christian background. We might not have a strong relationship with the Lord. We might not know uh, that we can connect with him. We might not know who he is, but we sort of decide, yeah, I kind of want to come back to church and begin to figure this thing out and begin to invest in it. Um, I, I'm not really committed to Christianity. I don't really have it figured out, but uh, I just want to begin uh, to get into it and to begin uh, to connect. So he becomes king at this age eight and basically set, starts to set the kingdom on. It's kind of a good trajectory. Um, meanwhile, the idols are all still there in everybody's homes and in the temple, but he's doing what he knows. He's doing uh, what he knows to do. And I think that's just that next slide. You know, you, you can live a pretty good life and generally be invested in the church and in, in community. You can generally do good things and still not really know the Lord. 
That's where Josiah was, and, and something is about to happen to him, which is going to flip a switch in his heart. And that's what we want to notice as people. We can all put ourselves in this Josiah state, like just before his great revelation that's about to come to him. Like, like we're all kind of invested. We're all kind of doing the thing. We're, we're building up the house of the Lord. Uh, we're Christians. But, but what if something a little bit more radical begins to happen in our lives? We're... we're if you're a person who's been sort of spiritual but not passionate, not faithful, this is a moment for, for you to really pay attention to. In 2 Kings chapter 22, uh, verse 8, and one of the things you'll note when I'm, when I'm giving these scriptures is I'm just giving us highlights of the text. There's bits that I'm taking out and I'm missing just details that I'm skipping over, but I really, really encourage you to just read this whole thing. 2 Kings 22 and 23, just read it thoroughly yourself because there's just more detail and more beauty that I just can't share in the time frame that we have. In 2 Kings chapter 22, 8, it says, And Hilkah the high priest said to Shaphan, the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, and he read it. The idea that they found the book of the law in the house of the Lord tells us that it was lost. It tells us that it was lost. And if you want to look at your life, and I want to look at my life and see anything of nominalism in my life, anything of, I'm not on fire, I'm not connected, I've, I've allowed things into my life that ought not be in my life. I just want us to ask the question as we go through this next bit of the text. Is there any chance the book of the law, is there any chance the Bible's been lost? Imagine uh, the time, years of idols being in the temple, the priests not reading the scriptures publicly for the people. Imagine somewhere in some corner of the temple, in some dusty niche in the wall, is this scroll that's covered in dust. It hasn't been unrolled for years. Maybe you have a dusty Bible sitting on a shelf somewhere. Imagine the filth of the place with the worship of idols. It was in that temple that Josiah's grandfather sacrificed his child. In the presence of holy God, in the presence of the Lord, just feet from the holy of holies where, where that, that chamber hadn't been opened, that curtain hadn't been opened, and nobody had gone in to look at the holy of holies to, to find uh, the book of the law, to find the tablets of Moses. Nobody had been seeking, nobody had been looking. So busy with the idols in the temple, somehow this person who uh, was serving Josiah managed to make his way into that place and in some niche uncovered the word of the Lord. And he read it. And he read it. Boy, do we need to have that in our lives. Boy, do we need to have that in our lives. There are dusty pages of this book that you and I haven't dug into, that we haven't opened, that we haven't poured over, that we haven't wrestled with. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, uh, and, and this is just a summary from uh, you know, verses 1 to 14, I'm just grabbing again snippets of it. Remember, this is in 1300, uh, so hundreds of years before the time of Josiah. The law is given and they're warned about what happens. The whole commandment that I command you today, this is probably Joshua talking or possibly Moses talking to the people of Israel. The whole commandment that I command you today, you shall be careful to do that you may live, observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in obedience to him and revering him. Take care lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them, when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied, lest your heart be lifted up, lest your heart become proud, um, and you forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I solemnly warn you today that you shall surely perish. You shall surely perish. Oh, that we wouldn't forget the word of the Lord. Oh, that we wouldn't forget the commandments of God. This moment that Josiah is living in, where very slowly, since the 
1,300 years before, since the time of, of Moses, um, like almost 1,000 years before, since the time of Moses, uh, there, there's been this drift, right? The word of the Lord has been forgotten. Uh, idols have just sort of made their way into a few homes out in the periphery. Uh, idols sort of made their way into the city. Idols sort of made their way into the homes of the officials. And eventually idols made their way into the temple. And that's the culture and the space that we're living in where we as the church are surrounded. We as the church are are in a place where idols are making their way into our culture and step by step, moment by moment, decision by decision, every time we abandon the word of the Lord, we build idols in our own hearts. We take on the ideology of the people around us. We take on the thoughts of the people around us. Maybe your Bible is gathering dust on your side table by your bed as you watch Netflix and bathe yourselves in violence at night. Bathe yourselves in, in corruption. Bathe yourselves in bent sexuality. It, it, it's a reality that we are living in right now. Outside the church and in the church, the word of the Lord gathers dust as we fill our hearts and minds with other things. And we are very, very close to being in the place of Josiah where we have idols living in our hearts, idols in our temples, idols in a place of worship. It's where we're at. Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Idol worship doesn't begin when we start worshiping idols. Idol worship begins when we set the word of God aside. When we cease to meditate on it. We cease to breathe it in. When we cease to love it. When we cease to seek the Lord in it. It's a danger we face in our time. Second Kings 22, 10 to 11, then Shaphan the secretary told the king, Hilkah the priest has given me a book, given me this scroll, and he read it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. For us, a revival, I think, begins with the tearing of our clothes. Revival begins for us when we see the word of God and see what he's calling us to, see his vision for his church, see this call to mission that we face. And we look at all of the other things, all of the idols in our lives, and there is something in Josiah's mind in that moment that snapped, something in his mind that broke, and he repented. And he turned. And that, that symbol of the tearing of the clothes, we see it a number of times in the scriptures. That rending of the clothes, that rending of the clothes over the sin uh, the, that's in our heart is, is like a way of saying, a way of communicating publicly to the people around you that my life has been rent into. My life has been torn into. I am taking my grief and I'm taking all of the beauty that adorns me, the good things that, that I can show, uh, the ways I dress up, my nicely pressed shirt, and I'm ripping them so that you can see, so that you will know that I am not rich, so that you will know that I am impoverished. I want you, the community around me, to know my inner impoverishment. I'm signaling that to you. A child has been lost. A grief has happened. A king has died. I've encountered my sin. Whatever it is that's happening in the heart, the people in the time would rend their clothes to communicate outwardly their inner impoverishment. And that's what Josiah would do. And, and I think very often, I think people could signal an impoverishment without having rent hearts. Joel uh, chapter 2 uh, gives us a little hint that that's not our way Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your heart and not your garments. 
Don't rend your garments without rending your heart. Rend your heart and not just your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and merciful. And so Josiah encountered the word of God, and he let it into him. He let it into his heart in a way that actually was able to impact him and touch him and affect him emotionally in a way that the word of God rent his heart. Now, the word of God brings joy. The word of God brings hope. The word of God brings freedom. But sometimes... It rends your heart. Realizing that your life has come into conflict with God's word is meant to produce an emotional response. We often think, looking back at these Old Testament passages, that this is just an Old Testament thing. But I want us to walk through really briefly um, repentance in the New Testament. Actually, you can actually look online, and I just did, I just did some looking, repentance in the New Testament, and there's all kinds of actually really bad and wacky teaching on it. Like, repentance is not something we have to do in the Old Testament because Jesus has forgiven our sins. We just turn our hearts to him. And I'm like, oh, like there's a little something that's right about that. Like, we aren't returning to the law. We're not returning to legalism. We're not going there. But there is something that is required of us to turn from our sin as we turn to Jesus. There is a decision, there is a choice, there are actions to be taken. We cannot be turned to our sin and turned to Jesus at the same time. There is a turning that needs to happen in us. And I want to show you that. Matthew 3.8, this is John talking. Prove by the way that you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Uh, Matthew 11, Jesus began to denounce the towns where they had done so many of his miracles where he had done so many of miracles because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. Imagine that, the flowing of the Holy Spirit and wonderful miracles, but not producing any repentance in us. I, I, I saw that closely at one period in, in my ministry. Such pain. Uh, so, so the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn from God. Does this sound like the evangelistic uh, message that we're doing these days? No. Doesn't, sound, doesn't sound like it, right? Uh, but to see it uh, going ahead, um, you know, in, in the book of Acts, so this isn't just pre the cross. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repentance preceding the receiving of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Interesting thought. Acts 3.19, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Acts 11.18, when the others heard this, they stopped objecting. They began praising God. They said, we can see that God has given the Gentiles the privilege of repenting of their sins and receiving eternal life. What a privilege we have as Gentiles, as a gift from God for him to speak and inspire uh, repentance in us and and turn our hearts to God. What an incredible gift. Acts 20. I have had one message for Jews and Greeks alike, alike, the necessity of repenting from sin and turning to God and having faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. We're not repenting from sin and turning back to the law. We're repenting of sin and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. But repentance leads the turn. And then look at this in 2 Corinthians. I have a slide for this one. 2 Corinthians 7, 9 to 10. And Paul has written a very hard letter to the church in Corinth. He says this, Now I'm glad I sent it, this letter. Not because it hurts you but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have. Imagine that the Lord, there is a sorrow that the Lord wants you to have. The momentary. So you are not harmed by us in any way. For the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There is no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. 
So much counseling, so much work, so much heart work, so much trauma counseling, grief counseling, so much stuff that we go through and seldom do we hear the little bits along the journey about how we need to repent. The part of the heart healing uh, that skips repentance. That's why heart healing stuff sometimes doesn't work if it doesn't have that idea of turning from the Lord and repenting built into it. So there's a question for us here, right? Are there areas in our lives where we need to feel the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have? Are there areas in your life and in my life where I need to feel some sorrow? Where I need to see that the word of God as it has been spoken, as as I read it in the scriptures, comes into conflict with the choices I've made? And do I need to respond in that moment as Josiah did and rend my garments and rend my heart for the Lord and let it be torn and let it be broken and weep? Hebrews 6.1, so let us stop going over the basic teachings of Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. He's asking a rhetorical question there, like, man, how many times do we have to do this going over and over and over, over the, the, the very first repentance that we were meant to do? Have we become saved without repentance on the front end? is what he's saying. Has we accepted the beautiful grace and forgiveness of God and not actually acknowledged what we needed forgiveness and grace from? Go back and do the work of repentance. And so like Josiah, we rend our hearts. We rend our garments. And then Josiah... um, and we're going, to, we're going to tackle these in the next, uh, next week. We'll tackle some of these responses. Uh, some of the, 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 this tearing down, of course, that happened in the life of Josiah was the beginning. But following that, there was the building. There was the, the revival that came. There was the restoration that came. But we can't skip over this repentance part. But here's what happened immediately after. And the king commanded uh, Hilkiah the priest and Achor the son of Micaiah, and Shaphan, the secretary, and said, go, listen to this, go inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words that have been found in this book. That's our next step. If you're being confronted by the word of God, if if your heart is being rent, if there is repentance that needs to happen in your life for whatever it is, there's this call to just say, I need to inquire of the Lord. It's not, I have all the answers. It's not, I can complete this. I can do this. My life is turned around. Everything is set right now. All good. I've, 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 I've said my prayer. I've done my crying. I've done my weeping. Repentance has taken place. I've checked the box all as well. But Josiah, in his integrity, in his curiosity, and in his not knowing what to do with his grief, he goes and he simply inquires of the Lord. And here's this interesting response in Second Kings 14 to 20, just excerpts here. Uh, so they went to Hood of the prophetess, and she said to them, I will bring disaster on this place. I just want to pause there and note it for a second. Uh, what she's saying in, in, in that sort of broader context, and there's more there that I could use to unpack, and I'm going fast now a little bit for the sake of the time. But what she's saying is, hey, there's great wickedness in your context. There's great wickedness around you. Uh, you've repented. You've turned your heart to the Lord. Your turning of your heart to the Lord isn't going to change everything around you. It isn't going to change your circumstances. But because your heart was penitent and once you humbled yourself before the Lord and you have torn your clothes and you have wept before me, I have heard you, declares the Lord, and behold, I will gather you to your fathers. 
So with repentance comes this desire that, that everybody would repent around us, that everything would change around us, that our circumstances would become easier, that the world around us wouldn't be as dark as we, 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 we've experienced it to be, that this turning of our hearts to the Lord would just make things better. And, and the prophet is a realist here and says, that's not what's going to happen. The community around you, uh, you're going to institute some reforms, but they're ultimately going to uh, remain wicked. The question is, will you follow me anyway? Will you follow me anyway? Worship team, you guys can come. And so that's the question for us. Will we take the word of God into our hearts? Will we uh, embrace whatever it does in us when it comes? Will we open our hearts to receive, to let it confront us, to let it transform us, to let it make us new. And regardless of what is going to happen around you, regardless of whether it's going to make your life easier or worse or good or bad, will we follow? Will we follow? Uh, The prophet gives tremendous hope here. I will gather you to your fathers. It's about your relationship with me. It's about following me. It's about knowing me. It's about loving me. It's about honoring me. Will you follow me? Will you follow me? Will you turn from your sin? And will you follow me? And that's the question for us this morning. Are there areas that you need to leave behind for the God who wants you to follow?